Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Pori Ranch stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! The first one is titled, The Day I Won the Lottery. My wife and I like to play harmless pranks on each other, things like swapping all the photos in photo frames, or playing around with clocks, etc etc. All mild stuff. Once I convinced her she had won the lottery with the old record last week's lottery and play it back having bought the winning ticket prank. After the initial excitement, and before she tried to contact anyone, I revealed the prank and she didn't take it well. In fact, she got quite upset. It took a few hours before we both could have a good laugh about it. Or so I thought. Anyway, a few years later I was serving at sea as an officer on board a warship. We were deployed and had been for several months at this point. The routine was fairly dull, but the ship's company were keeping themselves entertained for the most part. The ship's chaplain, also known as the Bish, had commandeered the internal radio broadcast system and set up a schedule where members of the ship's company could DJ for a bit, or have a discussion, host quizzes, etc etc. The Bish's favorite bit was his messages from home segment where he would read messages sent to the ship from the families back home. As you can imagine, the majority would be insipid stuff like, hey Smithy, me and the kids miss you so much, can't wait for you to get home xxxxx. Families would email the message, and the Bish would read it out, exactly as written. Anyway, on this fateful day, I was on watch in the ops room. For those who don't know, the operations room CIC in US parlance, is quiet and busy and everyone is focused, especially in an operational environment, which is what we were in. After being in there for a few hours, I needed a leg stretch and a drink, so I let the team knew that I was popping out for two minutes and headed into the wardroom to grab a cold can of Diet Coke and come straight back. As I opened the door and stepped in, a massive cheer erupted. There were about 10 other officers in the wardroom, all cheering and looking at me. Um, what's going on guys? Didn't you hear the bish on the ship's radio? No, I was in the ops room on watch, like you lot should be. Go see him, now, now. What, why? You have an important message, you're going to want to hear it. So I left the wardroom, aware that around half a dozen of the other officers were following me, and made my way to the compartment the Bish did his broadcasts in. As I walked through the ship, one sailor yelled out, Nice one, sir, and another, How much, how much? I was very, very confused. I stepped into the compartment and the Bish was mid-flow reading someone's message. As soon as he finished he looked at me, a huge smile breaking across his face. Here he is, the man of the moment. What have you got to say, op? About what bish, I have no idea what's going on? So you didn't hear you message? Shall I read it again, listeners? I realized that he was still broadcasting throughout the ship, a muffled, yeah. Could be heard. He did a little fake cough, and proceeded to read the message, Dear op, I'll get straight to the point, we have won a life-changing amount of money on the lottery. Please call me as soon as possible. Lots of love, Snugglepuss, the Sausage Monkeys, Blockhead and Pest Cat. I was utterly confused. The message would have been sent to the Bish around a week ago, and my wife had made no mention of it in the daily emails, phone calls I'd had with her. It was also odd that she'd signed off using our silly little family nicknames, Snugglepuss equals wife, Sausage Monkeys equals kids, Blockhead equals dog, Pest Cat equals well, the cat. This was not normal for her on any level, something was off. The excitement in the compartment was electric, everyone was slapping me on the back and shaking my hand. I managed to leave, saying something like there's a phone call I need to make, and retreated to my cabin. On the way there I bumped into the XO, second in command, who enthusiastically shook my hand. How much, how much? You lucky, lucky bastard. I don't know, I haven't talked to her yet, call her. I need to know if we have to put special measures in place. A little worried about what that would mean, turns out the Navy has procedures for sailors who come into a lot of money unexpectedly in order to protect them, who knew? I dashed away. Um, okay. I'll let you know. Finally in my cabin, I checked my watch for the time back home and called my wife. Hello? Hey you, apparently we've won a life-changing amount of money. A muffled giggle. It's a prank, isn't it? Yes. We won 10 pounds. Got you. 
Not really, I knew the message was odd as soon as I heard it. More laughter. Op, you don't understand, the prank is just beginning. You'll see. And, in that moment, I understood the genius of what my wife had done. I was due to stay on board this ship for another two months. She had just told the entire ship's company that I was a lottery winner. Everyone knew that I'd won a life-changing amount of money. It started reasonably enough. Pretty much everyone wanted to congratulate me, shake my hand and talk about what I was going to do with the money. I would try denying that I'd won anything, and then I'd get a, of course you haven't less than wink greater than, less than wink greater than, or in at least one case, getting outright hostile with me for, trying to lie. After a couple of days of congratulations came the beggars. From slips of paper under my cabin door to people on board I barely knew taking me to one side, telling me their life story and asking to either borrow or have money from me. Any attempts to convince them I hadn't won a lot of money were met with either, I understand, I wouldn't hand out money either, or were just plain nasty. As much as I tried to tell everyone I hadn't won the lottery, it took a lot to convince some people. Even two months later, in my last week on board, I was still being asked by some what I was going to do with the money and whether it was enough to leave the Navy and retire. Even now, years later, I received the odd text from someone who heard about my win asking for money. The next one is titled, Threaten and Harass Me? I'll get you shunned by your church, stop your free holidays and make you face reality. Finally got my revenge on my entitled aunt. My entitled aunt is not a very nice person and she actively goes out of her way to make other people miserable. In the past month or so, my entitled aunt, let's just call her Karen for the sake of the story, got in touch with me after a good and peaceful few years without talking to me or any of my family. Though it was only to demand that I drive her and my entitled cousin, we'll call her Regina, like the witch from Mean Girls, to a church thing that one of the church members was holding. I'm still not entirely sure what the meeting was for but my best guess is that it was to sort out the donated food for the food bank delivery thing that the church wanted to set up. Karen, however, didn't care about the food bank as it required helping others but was instead interested in me driving them there so they could discuss with Pastor Smith, not his real name, about getting Regina baptized. I declined as I wasn't sure about the restrictions with diving and stuff, especially considering Karen lives around an hour or more away from me. Also, she's not a nice person and I just didn't want to be around her. This led her to harassing me, posting absolutely horrific Facebook posts about me, I don't even want to repeat half the things they said in those posts. She called, messaged me paragraphs filled with vile homophobic and transphobic slurs, and a crap load of grammar mistakes. For some context, I am a gay drag queen, currently living with my boyfriend, and Karen absolutely hates me for it. She often tries to use religion to justify her hatred of me but she has actively admitted in the past that she does not believe in God's existence. Nothing against religious people, if you're religious then go on and live your best life honey but Karen only seems to be religious when it benefits her. A couple of weeks ago, the harassment finally got to me. I broke down in tears and had my first full-on panic attack in almost a year. The situation had caused my boyfriend, Andy, not his real name, and I to start arguing. Not a lot but we'd have days where he'd get sick of me just letting her talk to me like that and would practically beg me to do something to put an end to this. When I'm in drag I tend to be a lot more outgoing, confident and witchy and would have no issue shutting Karen and her hell spawn down but out of drag I am a completely different person, much more timid and not fond of confrontation. After a while of Andy calming me down and just cuddling, crying for a little while, I finally decided to do something about this. But calling the police to give her a warning, restraining order, whilst necessary at this point, did not seem like a big enough punishment for her. So, I started planning. I decided to gather as much evidence as I could. I decided to screenshot the messages and Facebook posts and put them in a nice little folder to send to her church. I also sent a message to one of the ladies in her church with some screenshots of some of the transphobic stuff she'd said, posted. See Karen has two Facebook profiles, one for pretending that she's the perfect Christian mum and the other was specifically for spreading hate, not very Christian-like. She had posted a bunch of vile things about how transphobic slurs should be wiped out, which I think we call all agree is pretty awful. That's also a more tame part of one of her posts, they practically borderline on death threats but I'm not even going to repeat them here. The reason for sending these to a lady in Karen's church? The lady's daughter came out a few months ago as a trans woman. 
Karen acts all friendly with the lady's daughter though because she's been on a few almost free holidays with this lady. The lady was generous enough to pay for Karen and Regina to go on holiday with her and her family after Karen made out that she felt guilty for not being able to afford to take Regina on holiday. Bullcrap honey, Karen is a benefit cheat, she gets, or got, but that's for another paragraph, over 250 bucks a week from Regina's dad in child support and my dad, cough scumbag cough, would help her buy groceries and put money towards other bills for her. She had more money than most people that work do. Nothing against people on benefits by the way, everyone needs help sometimes. Anyways, sorry for rambling, I sent these screenshots to the lady from Karen's church and she was not happy, to say the least. I sent a message saying that this was the kind of stuff Karen believed and that I was concerned for her daughter's safety due to the sheer severity of some of the insults and posts. She thanked me for the information and said she was going to have a word with some of the other church members. I was genuinely worried that this lady's daughter could get hurt though so I kinda killed two birds with one stone. From what the lady told me, and the angry messages from Karen and Regina, the two of them are no longer welcome on the holiday that the lady's family was planning for after lockdown. No free holiday? Shame. Her church has not been a fan of her behavior. Apparently she had not been showing up to any church events before the virus, unless it benefited her. She did not want to help with soup kitchens or food banks but she'd show up if they were giving away free stuff. Pastor Smith actually reached out to me to apologize on my aunt's behalf for all the trouble she's caused us. The church is very relaxed about LGBT issues and just believes in spreading love and helping those in need which I can totally get behind. I'm not sure whether she had an argument with the members of her church but the lady I messaged did tell me that she told a few of the members to duck off so I don't think she was happy. She isn't welcome in the church whilst she acts like this though they have told her that she will be welcomed back with open arms after she finds a healthy way to deal with all her hate. The church did not feel good about asking her to leave apparently but she was reportedly rude to other members of the church and made them uncomfortable so they didn't have a choice. They actually recommended a few therapists for Karen and maybe Regina to talk to and deal with their anger which I thought was a nice gesture and I seriously hope they do see a therapist. Anyway, the lady I contacted actually got in contact with Regina's dad about everything that happened. He was livid. Regina's dad is an absolutely lovely man. He cares about his daughter so much and it makes me kinda angry that she doesn't appreciate him. I'd kill to have a dad that cared about me. She freaked out with him when she was 15 because he got her the wrong iPhone. Like seriously? He was paying all this money for child support, I call it child support but it's really just to help Regina out since she doesn't have a job and is, like, almost 20. He had also been helping with bills and food etc as Karen was making out that she couldn't afford anything. This man. No. This saint even paid for these two to go on holiday, Karen told him she paid for the free holidays they went on with this lady, when they actually just wasted it on the most materialistic crap. I honestly felt really bad for the guy. He has a well-paid job but that's beside the point, he still pays for these two to do nothing and supports his new wife and their 12-year-old boy. You can imagine my surprise when I found out that he'd actually reported her for being a benefits cheat. I'm not sure how it's going as of right now but hopefully I'll have the details for y'all and I'll add them here in an update. I hope her benefits get stopped and both of them have to get a job. There is no reason either of them can't work, they just don't want to deal with people. Yeah which. I hope reality hits you like a ton of bricks. I also did contact the police and have been advised, due to the severity of some of the threats, to file a restraining order. Which I plan on doing. The last one is titled, Excuse me, Satan. I think you're in my seat. I'm going to start this story off by saying that this is absolutely not one of my most shining moral moments and that I'm well aware that I was a straight up a hole for doing what I did. My only real defense is that I was in a super bad place mentally and needed a mountain's worth of therapy. If you're curious about the circumstances around her, check my profile. Which was evil in human form. Now, on with the revenge. I was a weird kid growing up, really weird. It was mostly because I was being abused at home and forcibly isolated. My social skills were so underdeveloped that I had difficulty reading human faces aside from my grandmother, grandfather and father. Being the weird kid meant that I was a juicy target for bullies. 
It never stopped, but there was one bully that I hated more than any of the others. We'll call her Holly. This girl never passed up an opportunity to make my life hell, and since she lived across the street from me there was nowhere I could avoid her. Holly treated me like garbage, here are a few examples. She put dog crap in our mailbox on a regular basis. She let my dog out of my yard and I was never able to get her back. She would also sit on her porch with her friends and roast the hell out of me to entertain them if I so much as put a toe outside of my front door. It went on for years. I hated her with the fiery passion of a thousand sons, but while my grandmother was still alive there was nothing I could do about Holly. If I did anything to her or fought back in any way my grandmother would punish me for it and I was more afraid of her than I was Holly, for a very good reason. So I made a plan. I suffered through all the abuse and promised myself that when I was older I would make Holly pay for what she did to me. Thinking of what I was going to do to her when the time was right was sometimes the only thing that kept me going. Over time, Holly grew up, and eventually she left me alone and stopped being in a hole, unfortunately for her by then it was too late. I didn't give a crap about her new moral epiphany, I had been nursing my grudge for two decades and it was time for a reckoning. I was going to destroy that witch. When my grandmother finally died, it was go time, and I'd had 20 years to plan. I wasn't idle while I waited, I'd made it my mission in life to learn as much about Holly as possible, and to do it I became friends with a few people on the periphery of her social circle. Eventually, I knew more about her and her life than her own mother did. The first step I took in my plan was getting her fired from her job. It took longer than I would have liked, but eventually I managed it. Holly worked at a doctor's office, and I knew that the doctor she worked for was super Christian. Very straight edge, upstanding type of guy. He also had a huge influence on the local community. I decided to become a patient at his office, scheduling my visits to be on the days Holly was off work. After a couple of visits I just happened to notice Holly in the staff photo on the waiting room wall. I made a show of looking surprised and then concerned. I got to the exam room, and the doctor came in shortly after. The expression on my face got his attention, and he asked me what was wrong. I told him that even though I didn't want to, as a Christian the first couldn't keep my knowledge a secret and still sleep at night because I just couldn't let him endanger his soul and reputation by doing nothing. I had his full attention, then and I asked him as one fellow Christian to another not to tell anyone where he got the information I was about to give him. After he promised he would I told him that I knew that Holly was using illegal drugs. He was absolutely flawed and at first he didn't believe me. I told him that I understood his skepticism entirely, but it was easy enough to prove or disprove my information with a drug test. If I was wrong, he lost nothing. If I was right he was saving himself from trouble down the road. He finally agreed to test her, and he tested everyone else too so that it didn't look like Holly was the only target. See, I wasn't actually lying. Holly smoked a shitload of weed, and I knew that because it was my dad she used to get it from. He'd been her weed dude since she was like 15. Her test came back positive for marijuana and much to my surprise, Xanax. Oopsie. The doctor fired Holly on the spot when the results of the urinalysis came back and then he called me to thank me for telling him what was going on, and before he hung up he told me that I truly walked with the Lord. Yal will never know how hard I had to fight not to laugh at the depths of his wrongness. I thought I was going to pop a blood vessel. Phase 1, complete. I know what you're thinking, it's just a job and it's not like she can't go get another one, right? Losing a job isn't the end of the world. You'd be wrong. Remember how I said that her boss had a very high reputation in our area? That man called every single hospital and doctor's office in the state personally to make sure that none of them would hire Holly and risk liability and loss of community trust for associating with her. Holly's field of study was all pertaining to the medical profession, so her education was rendered worthless because nobody would hire her. I wasn't done yet. Nope. Not even close. She lost her job, and because she had no income her car got repossessed. She still had her family though, two kids and a fiancé. Who needs families? Am I right? With the help of a good friend of mine, we catfished the duck out of her fiancé. My friend is hot AF, and she let me use pictures of her to prove that she was really real. She even got on Skype with him once. 
When he finally made the arrangements for a face-to-face -face encounter and booked a hotel room I texted the screenshots of everything to Holly from a burner number. To say the excrement impacted the oscillating unit would be a vast understatement. They broke up, the whole thing was an ordeal and Holly was devastated. She had two kids, no job, and now no fiancé who could help her keep the family afloat. A normal person would have stopped then. Unfortunately I am not normal and I was going full scorched earth. I seethed for 20 years, no way in hell was I going easy on her. Phase 3. With her fiancé gone and no job Holly was struggling badly, she needed money and she needed it quickly before she and the kids got evicted. Meth is a giant problem in my area, it's high risk but it's also fast money and so I started subtly mentioning Holly's situation among my more legally questionable family. Eventually one of my family's friends who happened to be a meth cook got in contact with Holly and offered her a load of cash to let him cook dope at her house. It was supposed to be a one-time thing. Two days and then done forever. Holly was desperate so she said yes, everything went smoothly at first but dead in the middle of the cook someone called in an anonymous tip about an active cook in progress to the local narcotics unit. They rolled up on Holly's house at about 3am and caught everybody inside, including Holly red-handed making meth. Watching her cry when they handcuffed her and put her in that police cruiser was one of the most gloriously satisfying moments of my life. She was in deep legal doo-doo, and to make a bad situation even worse, most houses where labs are discovered aren't deemed habitable afterwards because the toxic fumes from the chemicals used to make the drug get everywhere and it's super hard and time-consuming to clean. It's up to the property owner to either hire a hazmat team to clean it, or condemn it and tear it down. A lab cleanup costs thousands of dollars. It would have cost more money to clean it than the entire property was worth. So it got torn down, with everything Holly owned still inside. See, you can't take things out of a meth lab because they're going to be covered in toxic residue. It can make you very sick, especially young children. Everything in the residence is usually counted as a loss. Now, some people sneak in and grab stuff anyway, but whatever, it's their funeral but since Holly was still sitting in jail, there was no way for her to get anything and none of her close family were interested in risking getting caught sneaking into the house and being accused of stealing or tampering with a crime scene. Holly ended up in jail for a while, and while she was gone the court gave their father, ex-fiancé, sole custody of their children, and Holly was only given supervised visitation. Two hours every Saturday if I recall correctly. Revenge is a dish best served cold, and mine was freezing. I was behind every single bad thing that happened in Holly's life, in one way or another for an entire five-year period. She decided she liked bullying me and making my life hell and she figures there would never be any consequences. Instead, I took her reputation, her job, her fiancé, got her arrested and convicted of a felony and her children taken from her and the best part is that she has no clue I did it to this very day. She'd forgotten about me, what she did to me impacted my life forever, but to her it wasn't even important enough to her to bother remembering. I was nothing to her, so she never connected me to her problems. Last I heard she was in rehab for alcoholism and had her parental rights terminated permanently. After she lost her kids she just sort of gave up and crawled into a bottle and never came out again. I was tempted to tell her, but I decided that the helplessness and confusion about why everything suddenly went to hell in a hand basket was the better plan, because that means that every now and again I can contact her and pretend to give a crap about her troubles to get a fresh revenge boner about her newest tale of woe. Thanks for listening.